What's up guys? Welcome to Bible Life. Today is Sunday, May 31st, already the end of May. Uh, glad you're joining us for our video this morning. It's been so awesome to see so many of you coming out on Wednesday nights. Just a reminder to all of you that on Wednesday nights at 6.30, we're having youth group outside in the front. Uh, we're taking all the proper precautions for meeting outside, and it's just so good to have youth group with everybody here. Um, this last Wednesday, we had some rain and stuff come through, so I, I know a lot of you stayed home. I hope all of you are planning on coming out this Wednesday. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we will keep live streaming as long as long as we need to <clears throat> with, uh, with other people still being at home. Uh, but just want to keep reminding you to, to join us on Wednesday nights at 6.30. You probably want to get here about 6.15 to get find a spot and get set up. Um, but it's it's been pretty cool. So Bible Live this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 again. Uh, we're going to start at verse 41, so grab your Bibles. Uh, but first, let's pray, and then we'll jump into our lesson. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning that we can share together online, uh, both our live stream service and in this video for Bible Life. God, I just pray that uh, everyone at home watching this video, that they would just be encouraged uh, by it, that they would um, they would know you more through the truth of your word. They would trust you. They would choose to passionately follow you. Uh, God, that even if it costs us everything else, as long as you are known and glorified, that that would be the passion of our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Um, all right, guys. So when I was in school, um, first of all, I hated school. I don't know if you love school, hate school. If you hate school, maybe this whole quarantine thing has been kind of like awesome for you because <laughs> you hate going to school. If you like school, it's probably been a rough go. Um, I, I just hated school. I remember being an eighth grader. And as I was walking out of my middle school, the last day of eighth grade, just thinking in my head, I only have four more years until I'm done doing this. Four more years. And four years is a long time. But as an eighth grader, I was just like, man, only four. Only four. I can get through this. I'm almost done. I can't wait to be done with school. But I can also remember as a, as a teenager uh, thinking about what adulthood would be like. And when I would hear from God's word and, and the encouragement of God's word to follow and pursue Jesus, I, I also believed a lie as a young person. And the lie that I believed was that when I became an adult, it would be easier to follow God. That when I became an adult, it would, it would somehow this whole following Jesus and reading my Bible and praying every day and making the right decisions and, and killing the sin that's in my life would somehow get easier. And that was an absolute lie. It was, it was a lie uh, because it, it's never going to be easier. God has given us all the strength that we need through his spirit and he's blessed us with that. Um, and so it's very possible, absolutely possible to follow Jesus and to be a passionate, strong Christian. Uh, but it's not easy because temptation is always going to exist. It's going to exist in different forms. So as you sit at home right now as a middle school or high school student, don't believe this lie that, that it's cool now because I'm young and I can do what I want. Uh, and, and someday I can get serious about my faith and it'll be easier then. I can't even remember uh, thinking about my youth pastor and thinking how easy he had it because, man, he just got to sit around the church and read his Bible all day. And now I'm in that boat and I realize, man, I have a family and kids to take care of and I have a ton of responsibilities and things that I have to do and things that I have to take care of that it's still so hard to carve out that time every day to read God's word and to pray and, and, and just to focus on my relationship with God. So hard to carve that time out. It's still a struggle. It's still not easy. So being young doesn't somehow make you more, less equipped to be a believer, less equipped to follow and pursue God. It's always going to be a challenge, but it's always going to be worth it every bit of the way. So let's read about Jesus as, as a young boy, um, because we get this story about Jesus when he was young at the temple and what happened. Um, the Bible tells us a little bit more about being young when we get to uh, the book of First Timothy. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but here's the thing. The, the stats tell us that once you hit 15 years old and older, and, and, and it gets less and less as time goes on, but once you're past the age of 14, once you hit 15, there's less than a 20% chance you will come into a saving relationship with Jesus. That over 80% of Christians become a Christian before the age of 15. 
That is an astounding stat. That's an astounding thing to think about. That as, as the devil tries to lie to young people to say, you can do this later. You can, you'll, you'll have time. You have time. First of all, it's a lie because we're not promised time, right? Like we're all old enough to understand that life is not guaranteed for anyone, young or old. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. And secondly, it's a lie because the devil wants you to believe that uh, being, being a Christian is important, yeah, but maybe later. You can, focus on, you can focus on you now. You can do you, and you can focus on God later on. And, and, and that's a lie. And the stats tell us that's a lie because over 80% of us believers became a Christian before the age of 15. That's astounding. All right, let's read from God's Word. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. We're going to go down through verse 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to, Jerus to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. That, that's kind of crazy, but you got to remember, like, families traveled in big groups of family or groups of people. Um, they obviously trusted Jesus, and he was, you know, a, a young man at this point, and somehow they leave him behind. Um, they've left the, they've left the city and they don't realize that their son is not with them. Not like the parent of the year award for Mary and Joseph in this. Um, verse 45 says, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him. So three days go by. This is blowing my mind. Three days go by. They finally find Jesus. Um, uh, when they find them, they went back to Jerusalem to look for when they Sorry, when they did not find him, they went to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And then he went down to Nazareth with them and, w and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor and God and, <clears throat> so in, and in favor with God and man. So Jesus is a young dude. He gets left behind by his family. They don't realize he's gone. They finally do. They go back. They search for him for three whole days and they find him. And where do they find him? Not out like causing trouble or having a good time, but in church listening to the teaching of the Bible and answering questions and just astonishing these adults with his knowledge. And I know you're thinking, well, this, Jesus is God. Of course he can do this. But you have to remember, Jesus chose to, to set aside his godliness and become man so that he could live a life where he could empathize and understand what it is we go through and what we do. And as a young man, he was passionate about serving the Lord. Jesus' ministry started when he was about 30 years old. With the, you know, when you read the Gospels and you read through all the miracles and stuff he's doing, you know, the first miracle we have recorded is the water and the wine. When you read those things, yeah, he's an adult. He's 30 years old. And sometimes we get tricked into believing, well, Jesus just did his thing, and then he got serious then, so that's what I'm going to do. That's not, that's not the truth at all. Jesus, from the time he could comprehend as a young person, he sought to learn and honor God, to, to learn the scriptures to honor God with his life, with his knowledge, and with the things that he did. See, Jesus understood even as a young person, he had a calling as a, a human being created by God to glorify God. So, so we have this example of Jesus. Um, your spiritual concern uh, should be for today. Your spiritual sh concern should be for today and not for a later time. You need to be concerned about your walk today. Are you honoring God today? Do you know Jesus personally to today? Is that a reality for you? Are you reading the scriptures and learning them and putting them in your heart? Are you praying? Are you treating people the way that God would have you treat them? Are you praying for others? Are you looking for opportunities to share the gospel? See, those are the things of today that mark someone who trusts God and is pursuing his ways. Uh, secondly, you don't let any, anything become a roadblock between you and your faith. Don't let anything become a roadblock between you and your faith. 
See, Jesus, he's almost like he had tunnel vision. He knew he needed to be in church learning about God and, and so much so that his family leaves and he's just like, I, I'm, I need to do this and his family's gone and it creates this situation, right? He, he almost had tunnel vision of, I'm gonna focus on God first and foremost and that's all that I can see and everything that I do is surrounded by honoring God. Don't let anything in your life stand in the way of you becoming the follower of God that you need to be. See, Jesus, he, he had the right perspective and he lives this life that he lives to give us an example of what our perspective should be like. But there are roadblocks that come along, aren't there? There's sin that we just can't seem to shake because we're weak and we, we give in. There's emotions that play into it. And sometimes our emotions get the best of us and we just act the way that we're not supposed to act. There's, there's just the struggle and reality of it's, it's difficult to live in this world and, and to face the fears of this world and to just always make the right choice to follow God because it's not always the easy choice. Rarely is it the easy choice. But see, Jesus shows us that we shouldn't allow anything to become a roadblock that stands between us and our relationship with God and growing in it and honoring and glorifying him every single day. Satan's attempt to derail you in this and to put those roadblocks up in your life looks like this. He, he puts things into your life every day that try to trip you up. There's temptations to sin. And we might be strong against those things, but Satan, he's, he's persistent and he'll try and wear you down. And eventually we become desensitized to things. Things that we once said, oh, that's sin, we become more familiar with. And then we kind of let our guard down. Uh, when I worked at the auto dealership that I worked at, the Chevrolet dealership, man, even the first dealership I worked at, that was just a rough place. I worked in the service department and the parts department. And so I worked with awesome guys, but guys who didn't really care about, um, first of all, God or Christianity. And second of all, they didn't care about how they sounded to other people. And so that meant that the way that they spoke was was pretty vain. It was it was pretty, pretty perverse. It was oftentimes disgusting things. It was almost always a lot of profanity. Um, there was a guy who worked in the body shop that would come get parts from me. He could drop the F-bomb nine times in two sentences. And I would just be like, I didn't even know you could say that word that many times in a sentence, but somehow he did it. And what I, what I learned in that, th that season of life is that even though I was a believer and I was trying to glorify God and trying to make good decisions, that the more time that I spent listening to that kind of language and that kind of joking, the more desensitized I became to those things and the further I would take it. Maybe I wasn't dropping the F-bomb nine times in two sentences, but profanity became more of a normal part of my language without me even realizing it. And now I'd be like, wow, whoa, watch your mouth. And I'd be like, I didn't even realize I was saying something wrong because I'm so used to hearing it all the time. I still struggle today. If, if I get angry or I'm having a bad moment, it is, it is unfortunately normal because of my experiences and being desensitized for those words to pop into my head. And I have to fight against those things and remember what God's word says about only speaking with a pure mouth and stay away from those things. See, we're, we're all guilty of imperfection. And so imperfection, it can sneak in, it can creep in, it can become part of our lives. And sometimes we don't even realize it's happening. But when we see it, we gotta take care of it. We gotta kill that sin. That's what the Bible says. And so when I see a struggle with that in my life, to allow it to continue is to, to allow myself to keep sinning. I have to fight against that. I have to get rid of the roadblocks. I can't just go, well, heard that kind of language for so long that it's just a part of me now. And just accept that talking making gross jokes or, or profanity that those things are just okay i can't live that way i can't just accept that as good finally i just want to leave you with this god doesn't look down on you because you're young god doesn't think less of you because you're young and he doesn't expect less of you because you get you're young first timothy four twelve says do not let anyone look down on you because you're young but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct in love in faith and in purity this is Paul's instruction to this young man, a teenager, Timothy, that's leading a church. He said, don't let him look down on you because you're young. Instead, really what he's saying is, man, show those old people up. Show them how to live. They, they think they're better than you just because they're older. 
And should we respect our elders? Absolutely, in every way. The Bible is clear about that. But that doesn't mean that you're disqualified from, from faithfulness or from serving or from the work of God. No, it just means you have an opportunity to go, hey, I get that I'm young, but I get it. I get my purpose. I'm going to live it out. And hopefully our youth group will be a group of young people that the church of adults looks at and goes, they're really setting the pace. They're really showing us how, how to do things, how to live. Man, those youth get it, and I'm encouraged by them. I'm encouraged by them. That's what I pray for our youth group. So Jesus, he was young, and he had the right focus. Paul tells Timothy as a young man to have the right focus. Don't let people look down on you, but focus on what matters, and that is your purpose of glorifying God. Let's pray. We'll be done. Uh, Jesus, I just thank you again for your word. I thank you that you don't look down on those who are young, but instead you equip the willing no matter their age. And I just pray that we'd be a youth group full of students who are willing to follow you and to serve you. God, I just am so honored to just be the, the youth pastor over these students. And I just pray that uh, you would continue to work in their hearts and their lives. And that as we begin to gather again, as we have on Wednesday nights, we'd be able to continue to encourage one another. God, that you would fight off this coronavirus, that you would end its, its reign of terror on our world and allow us to, to get back to meeting as a church the way that we desire to, the way that you mean for us to. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, guys. Have a good Sunday. We will see you on Wednesday. God bless.